My name is Merle Goldman. I'm a volunteer with the Chincoteague Island Museum. And today, which is January the 19th, 2015, as part of the museum's Life History Project, I will be interviewing Claire and Hal Lott. Both Hal and Claire are artists. They own and operate Lots Arts and Things, a <laughs> shop located on Main Street. Today's interview is being held in that showroom. <laughs> I would like to start by talking to each of you about your early lives um, because we're interested in knowing when you were born and where you were born and what life was like for both of you in general and the nature of your community. Was it rural? Was it city? Was it farm? Did you have a large family unit? Um, And were your parents people who were involved in the arts, or did they have some other uh, profession or vocation that they pursued? So why don't we start with you, Claire? All right. Okay. Beginning with uh, when and where you were born. I'm a native Baltimorean, (laughs) born on Falls Road in Hamden. Very trendy nowadays. Mm -hmm. Not so trendy when I lived there. (laughs) (laughs) I am uh, part of a family, my parents, mother and father, and uh, one brother, Phil, Mm -hmm. who passed away this year. Mm -hmm. Um, I was born, as I say, on Falls Road. What year? 1927. Okay. (laughs) Which makes me... Very old. Okay. (laughs) It was a good year, though. (laughs) Yes, it was. We lived, as I remember it, in an apartment on Falls Road. And the one thing I can remember happening in those (laughs) early days was uh, my taking my clothes off and running naked down the street. (laughs) My mother told me about that. I guess I was two. Okay. You don't know about that one. <laughs> it's about time after, you told me. <laughs> yeah. After um, Falls Road, uh, I had lots of relatives living in Hamden, too. My grandmother, my aunts and uncles. Uh, each of my parents was one of seven children. So they had big families in those days. And after Falls Road, we lived uh, on Sa- in, in Roland Park, if you no, Roland Park, mm-hmm. you might know, <laughs> uh, St. John's Road, right next to the railroad track. And I, as a child, I was terrified of the noise of the trains at night. <laughs> I got over it. I uh, went to the elementary school there. I remember my mother taking me to the library. That was very important in our lives, was reading. Uh, she was a singer in her youth. Yeah. Um, they they lived in pretty much in poverty, I would say. Uh, Grandpa died when he was quite young, before he was 50, I think. She's he, also a talented artist. Yes, she mm-hmm. she is. Here comes Kipper to I check have, things uh, out. <laughs> her prints upstairs the unre- are just remarkable. Oh, uh, little watercolors, you know. That was my mother, yes. Yeah, she had a magnific- <laughs> magnificent sense of uh, color, space and vision and color and everything. Mm-hmm. It was natural, and I guess that's where Claire <laughs> picked it up. My father was a radio announcer in Baltimore. Yeah. You may remember Arthur Godfrey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gary Moore. Yes. They were con- contemporaries. And your, of what my was your father. dad's name? Dice. 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 Claire Dice. That was your maiden <laughs> name. Francis. Yeah, Francis was my father's name. Okay. Okay. I participated in a radio drama with Gary Moore once, and he was directing it up. The Gas and Electric Company. 
Do you remember the <laughs> yes, electric company in Baltimore? And uh, I was part of the crowd. I was about 12 years old. <laughs> and he said, now, people, I want you to m murmur. The crowd murmurs. So he, when we came to that spot in the script, we all murmured, but I giggled. And you could hear the giggle. <laughs> and he, he stopped it and said, Claire, you're not supposed to giggle. <laughs> murmur. What does a that murmur, was, that was a what does a murmur sound like? Don't like? Like people talking in a crowd. I see. <laughs> I forget your father was a colonel. Well, yes, he was in the National Guard for many years and served in the Pacific. In the Pacific. And he turned 40 as, as he was a, a soldier. And I remember I have his, I did have his letters. Um, talking about how old he felt at age 40. <laughs> and your brother Phil, don't forget. <clears throat> Phil was a military man from age 17. He couldn't wait to get away from home, I think. <laughs> Signed up for the uh, Korean War at age 17. He lied about his age and served there and three uh, missions uh, in Vietnam. Hmm. Three. Oh. <laughs> so when did you become interested or how did your interest, do you Thank recall you becoming interested yeah. in, in? I went to Saturday school at the Maryland Institute. How old were you? Um, around 12, okay. 13 maybe. Mm -hmm. At the same time, well I, I won't do that. Uh, I got my original interest in art when I was in elementary school and Phil and I went to a two-room schoolhouse on Greenspring Avenue, which is still there, <laughs> a brick school. It was heated by a big stove. <laughs> hmm. uh, we had an out two outhouses in the, in the back of the school <laughs> and a pump in the front for water. Incidentally, my mother was head of the PTA, and she was horrified that we were all drinking from the same cup <laughs> at the pump. <laughs> so was the art a part and of your program? Art was a wonderful part. Miss Jobes, who was eventually the supervisor of art for Baltimore County, would come to the school once or maybe twice a year. And she'd drive this little car, and she'd open up the trunk, and here were all the art materials, and we all helped to carry them in, and we had art all day long, and it was wonderful. <laughs> mm. It was the same with the music. Mr. B.C. came once a year. We had music all day long. <laughs> I think that that uh, heavy introduction to, to the uh, world of art and music uh, is very important at, at that age. Uh, I could draw, and the kids all liked me to draw things for them. And the boys always wanted naked women. <laughs> but then I was I was uh, in the fifth grade, I think, by then. Um, in high school, I had a wonderful young art teacher. Her last name, I'll never forget, is Wackenfuss, hmm. which was a a candy company in yeah. Baltimore, her yeah. family, I think. But she would stay hours after school. To, we would have all these productions and uh, plays and, and scenery to make. Where'd you go Franklin, to high school? Oh, yeah. Franklin High School in Reisterstown. Oh, by that time you had moved to Baltimore County. Uh, my parent, yeah, in Pikesville. Okay. We had moved to Pikesville. My, okay. my mother bought the house during the war okay. herself, <laughs> when I think about it. So, so the school that you went to when the supervisor of art came, that was already, in, you were living already in Baltimore County at the time. Yes, that was on okay. Greensburg Avenue, uh, Chestnut Ridge, yeah, you may remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, when it was very rural, my best friend had a, a little farm where her mother milked a cow. <laughs> And they had chickens, that kind of thing. Were you still going to the Maryland Institute at the time? Not at that time. It was when I was in high school, I guess. I graduated with my class 
at age 16 from high school. We did, we uh, we had sophomore, junior. What was this? Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Right. Instead of the eight years. Right. So uh, where was I? <laughs> well, were were your did your art teachers uh, uh, encourage you, mentor you? Did people mentor you particularly in your? I felt very close to this young teacher. <laughs> And there were a group of us that, uh, we were groupies, I, I guess you would say. <laughs> and uh, most of us sang in the choir too. And when we weren't practicing for singing projects, we were with the art teacher in the elementary school. There were two buildings there, so, and we were over there helping her. <laughs> and she was wonderful. So at what point in time did you just, did you think that you realized that you wanted to pursue art as an adult in some professional way? Um, my father encouraged me. My mother did not, strangely, because I think she was artistic, too. Um, I was practical enough to think that I could never make my way as an artist. I, I just didn't think it was a practical way to live. And uh, so I decided since we had so many teachers in the family. I had two aunts and my grandmother were teachers. <laughs> my father was a teacher after the war and uh, I decided I'd be an art teacher. So that's how I got to be in the Maryland Institute and they had, the, the program was full time at the Institute until three o'clock in the afternoon and then you get on a bus or a streetcar and go to Hopkins and take night courses for your academics. So it was a long day. <laughs> I'd get back to Pikesville sometimes 10 or later at night. So hmm. That was a, a long day. But we both had the same program, very similar. He can tell you about how we met. <laughs> right, but we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there. So you made the decision to teach art, and uh -huh. when you finished college, you started teaching? <clears throat> the funny thing is, well, I don't know what I was thinking, but I accepted a job at Franklin High School mm. where I had been graduated four years before. Okay. <laughs> Phil was still in the school, my brother. I knew a lot of the kids, and I'm in touch with several of them still. Very good. They've come to the shop to see us, and it's, it's wonderful. But it was difficult. <laughs> to realize that these adolescent kids were not much younger than I. They were, some of them were four years younger. Right. <laughs> and uh, we all became contemporaries at, at the senior level, but when down at the seventh grade level, uh, it was a period of time for them where they didn't acknowledge adults. And I could walk down the hall of Franklin High School that I knew so well, and all these kids would be passing me by and they would never make eye contact. <laughs> it took me a long time to get used to that. It didn't, it wasn't personal. <laughs> no, I'm sure it wasn't. But I thought it was. Well, time. that's an awkward age too for those people yep. that were a few years younger yeah. than you. I didn't have an art room. Mr. Boylan and I shared the physics lab. <laughs> oh, he was so patient with me. <laughs> sure, Nicholas. Yeah, I had a cart that I, carried materials around and finally the next year I had a, an art room. Well that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so continuing with you Mr. Lott, what was oh, your, yeah, turn. your turn? Your turn. Mm -hmm. Your turn. My turn. Yeah. Where did you grow up? When were you born? Where did you grow up? What was your family like? Well to begin with I'm a Welshman. I was born in Swansea, Wales in a suburb called King's Dock. And uh, that's where I lived with my dad and my mom and so on. And I, we had a big black Labrador Retriever, you know, I remember him. Because uh, at one time there were some problems in the mill. He was in, in the tin mill, you know, in uh, Wales. They were the ones that more or less introduced tin plating. And um, 
there was a conflict of some kind, and these two guys were taking me off down toward the water, and the dog went and got my father. Ooh. I mean, yes, he went back. The dog, the dog is a smart dog. He went back up my father and brought my father down and encountered, you know, and, uh, encountered these men, straightened it out. But um, altogether, um, in that area, let's see, I was there for how long? You came to the U.S. when you were seven. Yeah, I was seven years of age when I came to America. And uh, consequently, everybody in my family became citizens. But I did not. I was too young. Oh. I was too young. You didn't tell how many were in your family. My family? Yeah, all those sisters? I was the youngest, and I had four sisters. We were in Wales, and my father was very high up in the tin-making business. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, he had a very good job, and the, the Germans at that time tried to recruit him but that's when Hitler was there, you know. And, of course, that doesn't go through. But the thing is that, um, <coughs> excuse me, they, um, my sisters were very impressed with the silk stockings <laughs> they could get in the USA. You're too young to remember that, but they were so not available. So my poor father lost out. We all came to America, <laughs> all of us, the whole family, and my sisters got the silk stocking. <laughs> and my father, I won't tell you what he got. <laughs> <laughs> When I was in high school, and during the war there were no stockings to be had, and we all wore dresses, nobody wore pants right. yet. <laughs> we would paint our legs with makeup oh, to look yeah. like stockings. That's because you're an artist. That's because you're an artist that you were able to think of that. I hadn't thought about that for years, so you mentioned silk stockings. <laughs> Well, I was seven when I came to the country, right? Okay. Well, I was born. Um, <laughs> of course, I had to grow up. <laughs> now, talk about the time between seven and the time you went uh, to the uh, steel industry. mill. The steel mill. Like, where did you go to school? What what city? You grew up in Baltimore. Did you grow up in Baltimore? You grew up in Martins Ferry, Ohio? Yes. Um, we came, we had relatives in Martins Ferry, Ohio. Okay. So they sponsored us, more or less. And I grew up in Martins Ferry, of course. And, um, well, um, I went to high school there, naturally. And, um, were you interested in art? Did you have an interest in art well, when you were it, young? I was always interested in art. And um, I entered some kind of a contest, I remember, when I was younger. And I won it. And I got a, a correspondence course in art and instruction. From my father was the one who participated, uh, you know, pushed me on that, in that direction. Mm -hmm. I was self-motivated, but my father also was the main gear behind me, you know, he made sure I did the right things. And, um, well, when, uh, eventually, you know, uh, so I would go, you know, I had to be, live three years in one place before they would recognize me. And uh, I was on my own, living at YMCA and this, that, and the other, and pretty difficult for me at the time to stay three years in one place. 
I was working in a steel mill, you know, and this, that, and the other. I was uh, deferred from service because I was working in a steel mill, like I told you. Right. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I was deferred, and that was a critical area. <coughs> but I uh, didn't feel good about it, so I volunteered for the Navy, see. I volunteered, and uh, in the process of volunteering for the Navy, I became a citizen of the United States of America. <laughs> in the Navy, in the Navy, let's see, uh, what happened on that now, in the Navy? Oh, they were training us to be uh, radio men, you know, take mm -hmm. the code. But you have to take so many words a minute. And there were three of us at the same time, we couldn't do any more. But the three of us could type. We could type. So they sent us to Comnav U in London, Commander and Naval Forces European. And we worked there on what was now called a teleprinter. It was sort of an invention at that time, you know, a secret. But the thing was that they had women in London, then they shipped us with the Army Signal Corps over to, uh, not Normandy, Normandy was up to Cherbourg, further down. They shipped us over there, and then we would be in liaison with the Army Corps. We get their information and send it to London to the Commander of Naval Forces European. Was this during the war? D-Day. Oh, it was D yeah. about D-Day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyways, uh, we would have wound up probably on an LST or something like that, a landing ship tank, and, but the fact that we couldn't handle the code fast enough, they used us then, as I said, taking uh, actually on like a typewriter. It would make a tape. And we'd uh, take the tape to the commanding officer, you know, back and forth. And that went on for a while. We were in Europe, um, the three of us. We followed the army, went all the way to Paris, La Havre, all those places. We weren't there. When victory uh, came, we were in Paris hmm. at the time, the three of us. Um, Kenny Fry and... The other guy's name. Anyways, there were three of us. I have a picture of us somewhere. And um, eventually, um, we came back to London. But somehow or other, uh, it affected my hearing. It either dropped down so fast, I forget what it was, but it affected my hearing. And when I was coming out, they picked up on that. I was not hearing. You know, so they uh, offered to give me something, you know, to use. But it was a great, awkward thing with uh, this, that, and the other wires and everything. So I wound up buying my own hearing aid, see, like this. Right. And that's what I've worked with since. I'll tell you another instance stuck in my mind when I was going in the Navy. <coughs> Like I could say, I could swim well and I did the jump off the high things and all that. But uh, I had to have 20-20 vision. And uh, basically if I had passed that, I'd been put in a submarine. That's what they're looking for. <laughs> well, they had to be healthy and they don't want to take anybody in the submarine. It's not first class. Well. I didn't have 20-20 vision then, and otherwise I would have been in the submarine service. <laughs> but yeah. it turned out, I went into Actually, the has no vision signal anyway. corps, you know. <laughs> but anyways, uh, they, um, consequently I didn't get into the submarines like I told you I went into the other aspect of right. it. Right. But, it's those things that happen, you know. He never complains. <laughs> well, when I came out, I told you they were clicking coins behind us. I didn't hear him. 
Mm. You know, all that, that was sort the of test thing. in those days. <laughs> so you never know when life's going to turn this way or turn that way. It's, mm -hmm. Let's see, now I came back from uh, the Navy and I was at home in Lawrence Ferry. And I had an uncle that was a superintendent of the tin mill in Baltimore. Okay. And he told my dad, it was a, you know, it was a recession then. My dad didn't have a job. So uh, he told dad, come on over and we get you hired. But then it turned out they, they wouldn't hire him. He was too old, they said. So my uncle said, send Hal over. So they hired me you know, in the tin mill, and I was a uh, an inspector, actually. And if you're familiar with tin mills, you know, they have big carousels where dip the metal in and put it in tanks and then take it down and it goes through the tinning machines. <clears throat> My job was with clipboards to get the information of what was in the tank, what they did with it, then took it down with the cranes, to the tending uh, machines. It was my job to make sure those tanks matched what was supposed to be here in this machine. Okay. See, that was my right. job. And um, I did that uh, for quite a while. You went to night school at the same time at the institute? Yeah, at, uh, at night I'd go um, to night school at the institute. I went to uh, Johns Hopkins, didn't I? You did the same thing I did. Okay. We were in the same course. Okay, at Merrill Institute. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Teaching. The Navy, and then you came back. The war was over, and you came to the Yeah, Institute. I went over, and I came back, and uh, I realized I had vacation time they owed me at Steel Mill. And I had an opportunity to go to the, inst the Art Institute part-time, right. at night and so on. Right. Now that's how I picked up on that. Okay. <clears throat> Between the two things, that's what I was doing at that time. I came out of the Navy, right? Then you met me. <laughs> uh, well, what that happened was I went to the Institute and I was interested in art education. So we met with uh, academic dean Margaret Glaze, and I went in the office with her, and, and there were about five or six of us, I think. And I saw this particular lady further down. <laughs> she doesn't admit it, but it's true. I saw her on that day. I saw him. And I <laughs> think I took her to lunch that day, but she doesn't. Remember. I worked in the cafeteria. <laughs> she was. In, don't talk about that. You were stealing them blind. <laughs> we would get free meals, this, that, and the other. You know, a lot of fun. But eventually, um, we, um, as I say, I met up Claire that first day, and uh, that was the beginning of a long time. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> well, I, I want to go back to that same day because this was the first day that the GIs arrived at the Institute, and they oh. came in a group. So, parts of uniforms they were, they were wearing, <laughs> and the rest of us, all the girls and gays from the, that were enrolled already, I was a sophomore, we're watching these guys come in and I saw him. Oh my gosh, I thought, this is the one. <laughs> you don't believe in love at first sight. You believe. Yeah. <laughs> 66 <laughs> married years. <laughs> Wonderful. So you dated for three and a half years. My parents were totally against it. <laughs> I was young, <laughs> at age 19 then, uh, Hal wanted to give me a ring. And he went to a pawn shop and bought a, a really nice jade ring, which I still have. <laughs> and <laughs> my parents were appalled, you know, this is too, too soon, too fast. Too... But uh, we hung in. But you have to remember... Uh, <laughs> and they hung in. <laughs> I... Um... Remember that I um, 
<clears throat> got a suit made especially for the occasion out of army pink, they called it, you know. You're talking days. about the wedding. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, was living at y, I was living at YMCA. And um, we went to New York, you know, the two of us, and it rained. We got caught in a rain, and my suit shrunk. <laughs> Um, you know, you got too tight on me. <laughs> and this an evening. But anyway, anyways, was this we after you just time. been married? You just been married. The day we were married. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and we had a good time in New York, but we came back, you know, and everything. And but um, Claire's mother was on her own, you know, uh, there in Baltimore. What but town did you? All I can remember basically was. Um, going to see Claire's mother. She was still up in Baltimore. And she didn't think too much of me. She wasn't too happy with me being a Navy man, you know, and a Welsh one, oh my Lord, no, 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 no. But anyways, I'd go to see her. She was on her own in Baltimore. And every time I went, I would take her to the biggest Hershey bar I could find. <laughs> you know, I used to get big ones like this. And eventually, I think it took a while, she finally told my older son, you know, your dad, not so bad after all. <laughs> but it took a lot of chocolate to turn her around. That's a, that's a good laugh. <laughs> but her father and I were like this. And uh, we would drive around with him. He was. He'd scare the hell out of me. He would drive two intersections and all that, you know. He was very daring. And he had a daring brother who was a pilot in a plane and so like that. And they were wonderful men, uh, but they lost their lives in a storm down south there. Fishing? Fishing one time. Oh, wow. Got caught up in a big storm and didn't, get, didn't make that it back. That was way after, after the war. But I used to go fishing with him in a boat. The lightning would be striking, and I said, "France, we're going to get out of here. We're going to get a bite, <laughs> you know." And uh, Lock Raven. <laughs> he was that kind of an individual, you know. He, um, but anyways, um, it all worked out very well. After after you graduated from the Maryland Institute, uh, did you start teaching at that point? Uh, where was I? 19, it was the year, uh, 48 was the year we got married. You you started teaching at Milford in 49. Uh, yes. Brand new um, school. And you started to teach at Milford. Yes. That yeah. was, um... 1948. 49. I, w no, I went to Hopkins, didn't I? Yes, you did yeah, too. Yeah, that's where I got my uh, art education. And um, then I started teaching at Milford. And that was, to me, was a wonderful experience. I had a lot of fun with the kids, you know. I had a bike that I was right up and down the hall in, you know. and. And uh, one, one time we were always <laughs> playing games, you know, on the second floor of the school. And I, my uh, teaching mate across the hall was um, in inter interviewing some individuals from someplace you else. You don't understand? Yeah, I forget. And I went in and stood with them, you know. <laughs> and the principal came in the door. And I hear I'm here with these guys supposedly from South America or someplace. <laughs> I had to pretend I was one of them. And it was just, we did the damnedest things. <laughs> and um, anyways, this friend that I worked with was a wrestling coach. And I remember he'd, he'd catch one of these guys with problems with him, you know. He would put his head down and bang him right against the wall, you know, and things like that. And I had another one, a friend, Stanley Benson, we mentioned his name frequently. I had these, uh, they were at cliques, you know, because mm -hmm. different schools were brought together. Right. And there was four girls who were giving everybody a fit. 
And um, I one day I came and he, oh, I wanted them to meet after school with me. And they didn't show up. So I went in the office and uh, the principal come, hey, your class is up there. I said, I'm not going up there. I'm going out there to see the superintendent. If these girls do not come in and I, you know, that's going to be it. Well, it didn't take long. He got them. You know, I didn't have to go to see the superintendent because they knew I would. <coughs> but anyways, we straightened all that out. But uh, at some point in time, um, so all of your teaching in the classroom was at Milford. I won. All, all of, of the teaching at Milford. Yes. How long? No. no. All yeah. of the teaching that you did was at Milford Mill High School, He correct? taught at the Institute. You oh. taught night school at the Institute. Yeah. A couple okay. of those years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what courses did you teach? Do you remember what courses they were? Painting, drawing? Do you remember? Do you remember night school courses? That I don't you taught. remember. Think for a minute. Uh, in the night school, I would uh, teach uh, fundamentals of art. Mm -hmm. That was a particular curriculum that I had. Right. And uh, uh, what do you call it about design? Design. And, and, uh, yeah, and then design, problems in design, stuff like that. Basically, those two courses. Well, then, there was a whole period there where he worked on his doctorate in Columbia, okay. in New York. Yeah. So when you were at Columbia, mm -hmm. you were not teaching in Baltimore. No, he was in the class in the classroom at Milford. Oh. And he was awarded this um, fellowship. I won a fellowship. Yeah. Um, John I, Hay uh, fellowship. <laughs> I wrote, a, you had to write an essay or something, you know, and apply for it. And my essay was about uh, the Welshman that was supposed to be the famous pirate Blackbeard. <laughs> he was a Welshman. So I wrote that with that idea behind it. <coughs> and um, I got the award. I won a fellowship to Columbia. And um, I go back and forth to Columbia, you know, and uh, we lived there the first year, the whole family. Yeah, they, we had a stipend. It was a wonderful you, year. Then Claire came home, but then I would the, the uh, two boys and I. I would go down art education, mm -hmm. and um, so your PhD is in art education. Mm -hmm. Then he went, yes. he went yeah. back and forth right. from Owings Mills to yeah, New I'll York. Yeah, I went back and forth, but uh, <clears throat> they said, uh, well, my excuse was, you know, I want to see my wife, you know. Because the income tax people got onto it. <laughs> <laughs> They've got all this transportation on the bus. Oh. That was funny. But I remember there was another superintendent. Um, Percy. Hmm? Cursey? Music? No, 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 no. The one that uh, defended me for, uh, you know, going, oh. using the money. I forget the name. Anyways. I forget. <clears throat> they were trying to say I would, couldn't use the money, you know, to travel back home <laughs> <clears throat> to see my wife. Oh, your stipend. They didn't want you using they it They didn't that. like that. But the thing was, I forget who it was, defended me and said, you can, you know. So that was taken care of. And um, eventually I came back, of course. And you had your Ph.D. in art education. And then you became, at some point, um, the head of art education for the entire state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Which is a, you know... They, um, they were looking for somebody, I think. I forget what happened, but um, I had a friend, Mary Walkwitz, Mary Walkwitz, anyways. 
Uh, she was a good friend of mine. She was a supervisor in one of the counties. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, she recommended me. And there was another gentleman somewhere that worked with your dad. I forget his name. But the two of them put my name up. And consequently, I was picked then to be the superintendent for arts education in Maryland. And that included all arts, any of it, you know, music or anything. Theater. And that's pretty much where I stayed until I left. So course. how long were you in that position? How long do you think About of? About 18 years, I think. 18 years? I think so. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We were trying to figure it the other day. How many years? Well, you put in 28 years. You got two years for your military, and then <clears throat> of that 28, I think you taught at Milford at least 10. Maybe it was the other way around, 18 years at yeah. Milford. In any case. Yeah, yeah. So when now, you uh, finished, when you when you left being the, uh, you were telling me before something about the Eastern Shore and art. What was it? Would you want to share that? Uh, how? When how we ended up here? <laughs> well, no. Before that, you said that um, when you were the head of art education, that one of the areas in the state that really uh, did not have an adequate art education was the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Yeah, you told you told the story about uh, all you had to do was say quack. <laughs> Was that what, uh, what you're mean? What did I do when I traveled around? Well, well, not so much that, but I remember that. Um, yeah, art education on the Eastern Shore yeah. was not very good. Uh, the problem basically was they were hiring people that really knew nothing about art, and uh, I would observe, uh, you know, different teachers. Obviously, as part of my job. My general feeling was, if you could quack, <laughs> you could teach art on the Eastern Shore. <laughs> but anyway, um, I stayed with that, I guess, right along until we <laughs> left, didn't we? Well, you retired. Then. I hope that you yeah. made some changes, hopefully, for those children on the Eastern Shore that they finally well, got Well, I had... Um, Talk about art education on the Eastern Shore. I told you. You didn't do it. It wasn't anything. very good, you said. It wasn't good. What did you do? <laughs> I would observe teachers. But how did you make it better? How did you make it better? Well, what I would do, I would take material every time I go to any particular county I'd have a briefcase full of things I could hand out. Lesson plans, you name it. Any information I could call that I thought might help them out. So consequently, every time I visited teachers, I had a lot of handouts. <coughs> well, that was basically the way I was trying to reinforce their right. situation. Right. The fact that I say quack is simply a joke, you know. Right, 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 right. But on the other hand, it worked. Some people just quacked. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this. At some time in your life, you moved to Chincoteague. When did that happen? Uh, uh, let's see. Our barber in Pikesville, Hal's barber in Pikesville, talked about the fishing on on the eastern shore and especially Chincoteague. And he kept saying, you ought to go down there. Oh. So we had our young family. We, we have three, uh, two boys and a girl. And uh, we started coming down to Tom's Cove to camp. And Megan and I, she's our youngest, would cry every time we had to leave because it was such a wonderful place. It was like nothing that I'd ever seen in Baltimore. And the, the idea of being able to walk until you never saw another footprint was just so intriguing to me. <laughs> and I did do a lot of that walking. But uh, 
we weren't expecting to live here because we had bought property in Garrett County. Mm -hmm. And that was another area that we loved. It was mountains and stars and it was a terrific place. I won't go into it. But uh, it was too far to settle there or here. And we, we were freezing one spring break. We piled the kids in the car started driving around the town just to see what the town was like. It was cold, it was rainy, and we came to this intersection. There was a for sale sign on this house. Three rooms. This room, the one upstairs in the kitchen. <laughs> there was a screen uh, porch on the back. And it just spoke to me and to Hal, and we said, that's it. <laughs> but had you visited here a lot? Before mm -hmm. you did make that decision, I would say, yeah. So years. you would come down and well, camp a lot, yeah, and fish. But uh, also, the idea of running a shop was in my head from the time. Well, I worked at Lysa on Charles Street. Did you know Lysa Incorporated? No. One of those high-end shops, uh, gift shops, and uh, they treated me like a family, like family. And then I met a woman at the Timonium Fair, Bertha Knudsen, Norwegian, and uh, I helped her with her booth, her, her uh, rug. She was doing braided rugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we became friends. She was considerably older than I, and she wanted to know if I would work for her and design Rio rugs, which are really works of art in wool. <laughs> Uh, uh, what do you call it? A nap, I guess you would call it. About pile. This long pile. 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 Yeah. And I loved the way she lived. <laughs> she had a farm way out in the country mm. in Harford County near, uh, oh, what was the name of that water dam up that way? Uh, Susquehanna. Uh, oh. Well, it was, yeah, near um, there. Pretty boy. That was okay, it, pretty boy dad. Mm -hmm. Near there, she never advertised, and she had this little shop about this big of things from Norway. Mm -hmm. And she imported the wool, she imported the little gift items. Like I say, she never advertised, and she asked me to come and help her with it. And I, I said, but I have a baby, and Megan was pre-walking, I think. She was really an infant. And uh, she said, bring her along, we'll, we'll fix up a crib here. And then, So the first day, I gotta tell you this, <laughs> the first day I came to work, she met me at the kitchen door, this was in her house too, and we went in the kitchen, she said, Claire, we're going to make cookies today. <laughs> she taught me all these Norwegian cookies. Mm. I still have the little tins. I make them every year, and um, that's how it started. It was wonderful, <laughs> and I thought that's the way I want to live. <laughs> so you worked in her shop for a long time. A couple of years. We were we were good friends, and uh, then I went back to teaching. Yeah, after I I stayed home sixteen years to raise a family. We have a, an older boy, Matt, and Jonathan, middle son, lives and teaches in uh, Hawaii. He was here just 10 days ago. What does he teach? Days. What does he teach? Uh, engineering. Okay. <laughs> well, environmental, a lot of environmental stuff. He is an engineer. At the college level or? <clears throat> no, it was high school. High school. And uh, Megan is here mm -hmm. uh, in Accomack County at uh, Head Start teaching. <laughs> <laughs> it's I was, kind of in the blood. I was active in the Teachers Association of Baltimore yes. County. And uh, Tabco. occasionally I would go somewhere else instead of there. And that somewhere else was down here one day, you know, mm -hmm. on a rainy day. Anyways, we um, acquired this place. Claire and I pulled all the plasterboard out of the ceiling and everything. <laughs> I put all the walls in the 
What you year know? was this that you moved here? And, what uh, year was it? 79. Everything okay. that's done in here, the cabinets in there, I built all those, you know. Everything in here we built, the cases and all that. And not quite that and, much. Uh, <laughs> when did you start working here? In the in the, uh, I know you did a lot of these posters that are on the wall here for the Pony Swim. In fact, I own several of them, <laughs> um, and uh, you did them silk screen. I know you really were fabulous at silk screen. And what other? So I know you did it for the decoy festival, and you did it for. Uh, well, that's a painting. That's not a silk screen. Okay, that's okay. the only one though. Yeah, okay. that's the only one I did. Um, these are silk Excuse screens. Me. Right. But you, uh, did you get involved in the uh, art scene here okay. in Chincoteague? Uh, did you get involved in doing art here when, when you came here in a big way? When we first came here? Yeah. You mean to the house? No, I mean you started doing these posters for different events for Chincoteague. I and kept nagging him to do them. These are the body of work. Okay, okay. I don't know what okay, you want to. I'll hold this for you. Like those that. are the, uh, the decoys. Uh, and then those this are the is posters. The, the and that's process. the process right okay, here. Okay, why don't we just yeah, um, yeah. hold it up. Yeah, that's, that's the process. Showing me how I did it. Point it towards. Right. Okay, let's put that up That's like this so you can see it. That's very interesting. Yeah. So you did a lot of these posters. You did them all. You did them all. In fact, he's, he and Tommy Savage all started the, the decoy all show. All the decoy. Again. Oh, Mr. Lott, I didn't know that you started the decoy show. It had fallen behind for years. And... Uh, and so 1983 was when you did the first uh -huh. poster on there? Okay. 1983. Wow. And he did one each well, year. And these are all the posters. And these are the posters here. Oh, and you did the pony swim as well. Yeah. Wow. These are wonderful. He started with that one. Wow. Wow. And Claire, you also did 82. art down here. You, you also. Well, an art teacher does all kinds of right. artwork. Right, right. <laughs> so, um... You came here, and what was it like here? What was the art scene like here in Chincoteague? I mean, now we have many people That's who true. live here or who have homes here part-time mm -hmm. or live here part-time who are very involved in the arts uh, and, and the cultural scene, um, and they're doing a lot to really um, expand it and grow it and Absolutely. make it a big part of the life down here for Chincoteaguers and others. But... Uh, what was it like when you first came here in terms of the art One scene? other shop that sold artwork, some artwork, and mostly it was carving, was the brand. And that's still here. And uh, I remember telling the owner that um, I was thinking of opening a shop here. We, we were friendly. I right. would always visit them. And she said, You'll never work harder in your life. And I said, have you ever been in an art room? <laughs> Public school. <laughs> well, that, that didn't go over very big. <laughs> but Nancy West started pretty much the same time we did. Uh, but Margot Hunt, you know the name? Yes. She was the, the shining light for the Arts Alliance, for the library, for many cultural uh, projects on, on the island. Yeah. And we really miss her. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. But it is, I mean, were there many artists here? Not, not it slowly has grown. Okay. Um, after we started, there were several years where there wasn't anybody else except Nancy, I think, started about that time, Nancy West. But um, now, of course, it, lots of them. Right. Well, what was your first year like here in the shop? Was it a good year in terms it's of... terrific. <laughs> oh, wonderful. We were so thrilled with everything. I was so happy with the way it went. And it was very informal. 
people just sort of gravitated here. It wasn't what I would call making a living. Mm -hmm. That's why we waited until we retired. Right. So that we could fall back on, thank God, Baltimore County's pension still holds. Good. <laughs> We're one of the lucky ones. <laughs> um, I always say that it wasn't a living, but it's a life. Mm. And people that come and go are friends, and it's wonderful. <laughs> it was a lot like Bertha Knudsen's shop. <laughs> oh, well, that's so nice. Well, it's been very interesting talking to both of you. <laughs> and um, Thank you. it's a real privilege for me because I went to school in Baltimore County and I attended Milford Mill High School. And uh, I was there from 1960 to 63 and started in September of 60 and graduated in June of 63. Right. And I took, I always had an interest in, in art and I took art as an elective for three years, and I was in Mr. Lott's class for three years, five days a week. And it was a wonderful experience. As a matter of fact, I can still remember one of the things that I did, I have it hanging up in my kitchen at home. And uh, it was a pen and ink, and we had to do it of a scary place. Oh. Mine's of a cemetery, and then we had to blow through this little tube to make uh, the ink what the ink that? spatter all over. Scary pen and ink. Scary pen and ink. Pen is and one, ink. Yeah. And then you had to blow through a tube. Yeah. To and, create. And, yeah. The, uh, and I still remember <laughs> that day in the classroom, in the back of the classroom, where the sinks and things were. I still remember standing there with you doing that. <laughs> and uh, uh, my friend and I, who both were in your class, we think about that with great fondness. And uh, those were special years. And you. You were a character then. He was. And I don't know that we realized it as much as I do now, but you were a character then, and you made it wonderful. And so it's a real privilege for me to be doing this interview today, and I thank you very much. That was very nice. <laughs>